I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. Today we are joined by Dave LaRue, bassist extraordinaire, the Dregs, Steve Morse Band, Planet X, Flying Colors, all kinds of great and projects. Joe Satriani. Joe Satriani, all John kinds Trucci, of Joe Satriani. Joe Satriani. Keeps me busy. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. So tell us how you got started. How did you get uh, into playing bass? Well, that's kind of a weird story. I, uh, in high school, I, I started to get into the rock scene. I started to really like music a lot. I started to mm -hmm. listen to a lot of music. My sister had kind of gotten just into some cooler stuff, and she was exposing me to more FM kinds of things like Zeppelin and uh, Cream at the time. And I was curious about it, but really had no inspiration to play. But then a friend of mine who was, I was on the baseball team with uh -huh. was also a drummer. And so I would go and watch his band rehearse and play and kind of hang out, and I kind of got into the whole rock scene. It's like, oh, this is great, I love this. But I was just a hanger on. Right. And then, <laughs> then the weirdest thing happened. So he, I went over his house one day, and he said, yeah, my bass player quit the band. And I said, wow, what are you guys going to do? And he said, I don't know. He said, but he left his gear here. So the guy left his gear at my friend's house, and he was kind of noodling around. He said, here, why don't you do it? So I'm fumbling around, and he's trying to show me all these cool things. And, uh, but, but anyway, I got the bug. Mm -hmm. So just from that, and, we st and then uh, there was, well, no turning back after that. Next thing you know, I was actually trying to learn a few songs and play along with him. And, right. Uh, we, en we ended up being in a band together at one point. But yeah, that's how it started. This guy, by default almost, this guy left his gear at my friend's house and I got to play on it. Did you ever ask for it back? I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, he, he's one of these guys who literally walked away from it. Just abandoned it. like, ah, I'm done with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, probably good for all of us. Worked out great for you. It did. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's it was, nice. I think it was a Hagstrom bass, nice. an old Hagstrom bass and custom amp or something like that. Right. But that was my first, uh, you know, taste of actually playing. And because it was bass, I've always played bass. I mean, I, I stayed with it. Fortunately, it wasn't a guitar player, or I wouldn't be playing with Morse. Right. Uh, right. So, so I'm, I'm grateful. I mean, and everybody always needs a bass player. Mm -hmm. but, but it was really a natural thing, too. It wasn't like I was a guitar player who ended up being the weak sister and pushed over, hey, play bass, okay? Just, you know. Right. And, it, and it was like I was, I started as a bassist and right. it ended up that way. Right. So speaking of Steve Morse, you're here on behalf of Ernie Ball Music Man, and you guys are putting on a clinic concert tonight. What kinds of things are you going to be doing? Well, we're going to play some, uh, with some tracks, some of the things we've recorded over the years, several different things. Uh, I'm not sure what Steve's going to want to play, but we have, we have a, a variety of tunes from uh, our, the last album we did with the band, which was called Outstanding in Their Field. Mm -hmm. I think we got a couple tracks off of that, and then some of the older classic stuff that we've always played. So I'm not sure what we'll do, but we got a lot of material available to us. And right. then we'll basically address the needs of uh, the audience, mm -hmm. both of us. And I, I actually learned this from Steve. Uh, when I first started um, working with him, he would bring me on clinics that he did. And um, I really got to see how he kept it kind of open and uh, would address whatever anybody wanted to talk about. I've been to some clinics since then where guys come in, one guy who shall remain nameless actually had a handout and he's, he's passing this out, and I'm looking at it, and it was really advanced kind of harmonic jazz theory. Right. Which, I mean, even I was confused. It's like the barbarian mode? I don't, what? <laughs> and, but anyway, so you have these kids there who want to know how to adjust their strap, and m meanwhile, he's, he's talking in, on another level. Now, I, so since then, I've always tried to follow the model of keeping it open and talking about whatever anybody wants to talk about so that we can talk to the kids who are just starting out Mm -hmm. and may have questions, and I don't want them to feel excluded or feel stupid. It's like, oh, I'm not going to ask a question because he's talking sure. about this other stuff. But if sure. somebody has something more advanced, as sometimes guys will ask you know, pretty heavy questions, and that's fun too, mm -hmm. but we tend to keep it open and let the audience dictate what we discuss. Right, it's much more inclusive that way. You yeah, cover I, the I don't think we can, you know, unless you're going to mark it as you know, jazz theory you know, level four, then you don't you don't want to throw a free clinic and say come to the, to the to the gig. Right, know? right. Yeah, it's right. just it's not fair. And and well, in your business and mine, we really want to include the young kids. We're, mm -hmm. I'm always looking, especially you know I play weird music. I really want to include them and 
get them to give it a chance. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, this is kind of cool. This, these guys can play. It's like, I, I need to investigate this. Right. You know, I don't want to alienate them. I want to bring them in. So anything we can do in that regard, and, and that, of course, applies to you, too. You always want young customers, sure. the, the next generation, who are going to be playing, which, you know, right now, the way the music business is, is, is kind of iffy. But, you know, we, we both have an interest in bringing that along. Of course, right. So again, speaking of Steve, you connected with him somewhere around 1988 is when you started exactly, playing together. How, how did all that happen? That came about uh, through uh, our keyboard player, Key, uh, T. Lavitz. Mm -hmm. I uh, was working in a band in the New York area where I'm from, and um, I forget exactly how, how we hooked up, but we ended up playing some, some gigs together. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of, enjoyed working with him and asked him to play on my band's album. And then he started to ask me to play on his stuff. So the relationship blossomed, so to speak. And when I was playing on his stuff, Rod Morgenstein was playing. Mm -hmm. So now I knew two of the dregs. So now I'm kind of working, working my way, way in. in. <laughs> and then um, in 88, the, uh, the dregs had been apart for six or seven years at that point, I believe. And uh, the opportunity for them to do some touring arose, and Andy no longer wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I had, and they were, and they did it. We did it as a quartet. And at that time, I had two of the three guys in my corner saying, "You should call Dave." And so <laughs> I auditioned for Steve, and the rest is history. Yeah, awesome. and, and it's really through T, who we all miss dearly. But yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah, um, he he really brought me into that whole circle. Right, right. So not just anybody could step into those parts. You got to have the chops to, to play that stuff and to, to just be able to hear those lines and memorize them. How did you work up to that? Or what, was your technical state such that you were able to just jump right in or how did you prepare yourself? Well, well, pretty much. I mean, it was short notice, but I was playing a lot of fusion and some jazz. It was some straight ahead rock stuff too. So I was kind of... Um, into all those genres and, and somewhat into the, what the dregs were doing. And mm -hmm. um, I was playing music of that style, not quite to that degree, of course. Right. But, um, but yeah, so I had the training, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, although I, I remember trying to transcribe some of those tunes that Steve wanted me to learn. I was like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Yeah, we did. He wanted me to play I'm Freaking Out, which I don't know if you remember that tune. Sure. But it's got these unison lines. <laughs> right. And, Playing them is one thing. Learning them correctly is a whole nother thing. <laughs> right. And uh, so, th so it was tricky. It was tough. And then, and then, but it all worked out well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, was it prior to that that you did Hub City Kids? Right before that. Okay. Yeah. Tell us yeah, about well, that project. Well, T, T was T was working with me on that. Um, well, that came out of a, a couple different bands I was working in. The guitarist Glenn Alexander and I were playing together quite a bit, and that's the band that uh, T came and played with, and that's why he's on that record. Um, and a band I'd been in previously, the guitar player in that band was a really great composer named Mike Santiago. So I did a couple of his tunes on that record. He actually wrote Hub City Kids, and um, although I named it. <laughs> he had no title for it. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's kind of how it just came together like that, and then I got some of the other, oh, I had been working with Rod, so Rod played on the record, mm -hmm. and then the guy I was using in New York played on the record, and then we also got Mike Stern to play on the record. So, right. um, yeah, that's basically how it all came about. Kind of all the guys I was working with at the time, and it was a solo project, so I, I brought in all my, my friends to contribute as they could. Right. And, right. Uh, and, that, and shortly after that is when the dregs thing happened. Okay, okay. Now, Glenn Alexander was also in Stretch? Yes. On that yeah. record as well? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Uh, well, Glenn and I have been working together since uh, probably f five or ten years before the Dregs thing happened. I mean, he's one of my best friends in the world. We have another project that we're doing right now that I'm trying to get finished mixing, <laughs> but my engineer keeps <laughs> having problems, so there's lots <laughs> of delays. But um, Glenn's also a great singer, and we wrote a bunch of stuff together, and, and we did an album that's kind of like uh, the dregs meet Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, Joe Bonamasso kind of thing or like that. But very obviously uh, instrumentally heavy and mm -hmm. a lot of bass solos and, and stuff. Nice. You know, since <laughs> we both wrote the music. Um, but yeah, so we're still doing that. And, but again, Glenn and I have played together for years and years. And a lot of the training I got to prepare myself for the dregs came from Stretch because mm -hmm. we... 
we played whatever we wanted, and mainly we challenged ourselves. We were trying to learn the hardest stuff we could do, and right. Glenn wrote a lot of really weird, odd meter stuff back then. We were doing Alan Holsworth tunes and you know weather report mm -hmm. stuff. So a lot of my training came from that era. That's where I right. cut my teeth. Okay. I, I was doing a lot of other things at that time too. There was a great band in Philly that I was playing with, more of a jazz thing, where I got some really cool Latin chops. Those guys were, I mean, they basically said, don't play that, play this. This right. is the authentic way to play that. So I, I learned a lot from those guys and I was working in a great uh, rock and roll cover band in Jersey at that time as well with this guy who sings like Robert Plant. He, he can do ACDC. But we were playing Dregs tunes too. I mean, we were at King <laughs> Crimson. So I've always been, you know, a little to the left. Right. But all those things combined is, is where I got my training. Mm -hmm. Right, right. When you, when you uh, come into a band like the Dregs where obviously Andy West has kind of laid down the foundation going up to that point, and even with Steve Morse band, Jerry Peake was on the first Right, he did the introduction. Right. Do you feel uh, uh, pressure to duplicate those parts, or are you free to, <clears throat> to play your own parts? I'm fr I'm, well, it depends on the composition. Some things are, are in stone, and, and that, that is correct for the music I leave alone and just emulate. You okay. know, there are certain things that I wouldn't change, and they're, and they're great. Um, um, but other, otherwise, I'm free to do what I want. Steve's really good about letting me play and kind of, he wants me to inject myself into it, mm -hmm. you know, and so any, any kind of soloing things are like, uh, like that, I would definitely do my own thing on that. Right. You know, but, but yeah, I, I did, I, I had to use a lot of the parts because the compositions require it, but, but where I could, I snuck my own feel in there. Right, you know? right. So you've worked with some of the uh, uh, premier drummers, we'll say. You know, Rob Morgenstein, Mike Portnoy, and, you know, a long list of, yeah, of great Virgil drummers. Yeah, Virgil Donati. Virgil Donati, right. Yeah, and Jeff uh, Campitelli from Joe Satriani's band is an mm. amazing drummer. Right, right. So as a bass player, what is it that makes those drummers great? Well, they're all different. And that's why I wanted to throw Jeff Campitelli in there. Mm -hmm. And Van Romaine is another great one uh, who's been doing the Steve Morris band gig for a long time. Um, you know, Virgil... It's funny, there's, there's kind of like a, a, a scale, and technically Virgil is just a beast. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's a 10 on the, you know, technical ability to play the drums. He, he's incredible. It's almost inhuman at times. It, it was, you know, ridiculous. And I love playing with him. It's very challenging. And the reason I liked the Planet X gig was because it's the hardest music I've ever had to play. Hmm. Um, and Virgil's great at that stuff. I mean, he, nobody can touch him with that. Although there's, there's actually a lot of guys now that are coming up in that school. Mm -hmm. um, and then Portnoy also has that amazing facility, but tends to be a little, he, he can also be a little more straight ahead and mm -hmm. just rock hard. Right. And, you know, and, and he has a, he'll have a, a big groove, but then he'll pull out all the incredible drum stuff. And then you, at the other end of the spectrum is Jeff Campitelli, who just has this huge pocket. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so easy to play with him. But he's not a, tech, a technical drummer like the others. You right. know? He, he doesn't really care about that. He's more of a pocket guy. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just really a lot of fun to play with Joe with Jeff on drums. Right. You know, I, I miss that sometimes. You know? Yeah. He's, right. he's big pocket. <laughs> Great to have that variety. Of yeah, things. yeah. And I, I do like that, and just to finish up, I mean, one of the things I really like about what I'm fortunate enough to do is the variety. Mm -hmm. I get bored very easily. So, it, I mean, we playing won't let with... the interview go too long. Then. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love talking about myself. I mean, <laughs> do that all day. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm sorry I interrupted no, you. No, that's all right. No, it's just that, like, for instance, Steve's gig is the best gig in the world for me because we do so many different things. Mm -hmm. He's got that Celtic influence, he can rock hard, we lean towards jazz at times, we do the Baroque thing, you know, we, it's, it's just a really eclectic night of music with him. It's really fun for me to do that and I right. love that whole thing. And it's the same thing playing with all these different drummers. Every one of them has a different feel and a different flavor and all the situations are great. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, but I'm not touring with 
any of them for 18 months at a time because then I might get bored. But <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So with with all these different drummers and some of them working, I mean, playing extremely intricate parts and, and the things that you're you're talking about being extremely difficult and complex, are you still locking in on the kick drum as the bass player, or are you listening to something else in the kit, or how are you establishing that groove? Well, no, that's all about having an internal pulse, especially mm -hmm. with Virgil, somewhat with Mike too. Those guys are playing all around the time and all around uh, the beat. Uh, through the measures, but through the downbeat, so I have to have my own internal pulse mm -hmm. and, and, and lock it down. With, with uh, Planet X, really my job was to be more of the anchor. Um, it was kind of a functional bass role for me, whereas like the Steve Morse band, Van occupies more of that role, and mm -hmm. Steve has me playing a lot of busy chordal parts, a lot of solos and melodies and stuff like that, so it's less of a traditional bass role. But, it's all about feeling it internally and not um, being confused by what's going on around you. Just just playing through the pulse, keeping it together when necessary for me to be the one doing that for the for the band, for right. the sake of the band. Yeah, because right. those guys will play way over the bar and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you got to be on your toes and. And sometimes the kick drum doesn't show up for a while, so right. you just <laughs> you can't lock you know, it. It's not yeah, there, he's right? not going to play one, <laughs> and so when they right. don't play one, you have to know where one is anyway. How do you develop that facility? If someone's getting into playing bass and they want to play those types of music, how do they get that inner pulse developed? Well, I, I work on that a lot with my students. Um, and as they become more advanced and we start talking about those kinds of things, uh, what we, it starts with working with the metronome and I have them play with drum machines some, because it's, it's more fun and if you're working on a 16th note slap groove or something, it's nice to hear the hi-hat so they kind of match it. As they develop, I start taking away the help, mm -hmm. okay? So then we go to an eighth note groove, and then just a click, and then the click on two and four, and that's all they get. Okay. And so they have to provide more of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, I mean, you can really take it out, and I, I've worked on stuff like this. You just slow the metronome way down, and, and you can even have it be just the downbeat, or just beat three, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a backbeat. So you're getting very little help from the click, it's not going ding, 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 ding in your head, which is, it's easy to play with. Everybody, just, everybody goes, what do you mean? I have great time. I, di I didn't get off from the click. <laughs> right. It's like, no, the click has perfect time or the drum machine has perfect time. Right, right. Now let's see how good your time is. And I, I actually do that a lot in clinics. I'll, I'll have everybody kind of clap on two and four with a drum beat and everybody's fine. And the audience mm -hmm. is in unison and it sounds really tight. And then I start taking away stuff. To, and by the end, I'm just having the click on two and four. And it's, you know, flam city. Like right. people are everywhere. Just applause, like, right? There you go. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what happens. I mean, it just falls apart because everybody's internal clock is a little different. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, many are not trained to pay attention and subdivide and right. do all that kind of stuff. So that's largely what I do. And then try to play with them without the click. But really, you can do a lot of that work by reducing the amount of help you have from the click, but still using it, mm -hmm. you know? And, right. and I think it's, um, I mean, a lot of guys in the studio, well, a lot of amateur guys in the studio will say, oh, I don't want to play with the click. And, you know, you lose your feel with the click. It's like, that's BS. You have to be able to play with the click. The, the best guys I, well, all the great players that I play with, have no, they just ignore the click. It's just a reminder and it keeps them on track so we don't get a little too far ahead or a little too far behind. Mm -hmm. But they, can all, they all play with the click and it's, not, it's a natural thing. Right. Some of the gigs we do now, some of the tunes, some bands, all of the tunes, the drummer's listening to a click. Hmm. And I don't even think about it. You know? Right, so, right. Yeah. right. So having worked with so many great musicians and being on such a high level yourself, what is it that makes a great musician? Wow. It, I mean, there's a million answers to that question. Yeah. What makes a great music? I mean... What makes them great? Let, let me ask you that. Well, I guess my feeling of that o overall, and of course this leaves a lot of things out, but I think a really great musician develops a voice of their own. When you hear them, you go, that's Steve Morse. Mm -hmm. That's Joe Satriani. And, and they... they have all the other influences, and sometimes you can hear those other influences, but there's no mistaking them. And of course, they execute well, and it, you know the music is right. played very well. But there's a difference between the 10,000 guys that can execute very well and play all the stuff, and they can play all Steve's tunes, 
but they're not Steve. Steve creates that mm -hmm. and has synthesized all that stuff into his own unique sound. And, and Joe and Steve Vai and Virgil and all mm -hmm. these people we're talking about have found their own voice. Right. If, for a long time with me, I mean, I was way too much Jaco Pastorius, but I was learning. Mm -hmm. And you know, in my early 20s, I mean, I was just emulating him like crazy and eventually got to the point where nobody thinks that anymore, but it's still there. Right. It's part of me. But I've tried to, um, you know, do what I'm talking about with the, these other great musicians and try to develop my own sound and my own voice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I've succeeded somewhat in, in that. And, and playing great music like Steve's music has really given me a great forum to do that in. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah. So it's a matter of bringing together all those influences, but yet putting them out through your own personality. Yeah, and anybody that says we don't learn from those who've preceded us is, is nuts, or they're missing half the boat. I mean, right. or half the battle, whatever, whatever the right cliche is. Um, we have to take that in. We, we have to understand what is great and what is great that went before us mm -hmm. and learn from it. Now, again, you don't want to just sound like that, but there's so much to draw upon, you know, and, 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 you know, shunting aside any kind of great music is just idiotic. I mean, we're musicians, you know, we, right. we, we should love all, or, or give all great music a chance. We may not love it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's genres that I'm not particularly fond of, but I can respect somebody who has their own voice and is playing it well, right. you know, whether it's something I particularly care for is another thing, but I still respect those who, master their craft and then and then make it an art. Right, right, absolutely. Right. And speaking of developing your own voice, you found your voice with the Ernie Ball Music Man basses. Uh, I did, yeah. yeah. Tell us how you uh, connected with the company and tell us about the bass you're playing. Okay, well, through Steve initially. Um, mm -hmm. Steve was working with uh, Sterling Ball at Music Man for a long time and uh, when I started working with him, of course, I got introduced and, and met the guys in the company. Um, and uh, the, first, the first thing he said, Sterling asked me if I wanted to play their strings. And I had been playing one that was very similar to it. So, uh, of course, I, I tried it and loved it. So I've been playing Ernie Ball strings since then. And then we talked about playing, would I be interested in playing their basses? And I believe the only one at the time was the Stingray. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a little, that was not something that particularly interested in me. It was a little one-dimensional for what I was doing. It's a great bass, so don't get me wrong. I mean, that's like, we're talking about a P bass. I mean, it's right. a wonderful bass. I would never play a P bass, though. I don't like P basses. It's not right that's for you. That's a subjective thing. Yeah, yeah. I, what I do, a P bass is worthless. Um, so, it, if my memory serves, Sterling kind of picked my brain a little bit, and we talked about basses and stuff. And the next year at the NAMM show, he showed me the prototype to the Sterling. Mm -hmm. And it had, uh, well, the body was different, n better for me. And it, but the main thing that it had was the three uh, position switch for the pickup. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a variety of tones that I needed. That's what I needed. Right. So that one dimensional aspect was gone. Mm -hmm. Now I had more of the bridge kind of jazz bassy pickup sound that I liked. The way they wired it, the, the, the two different coils, they had a uh, series parallel and single coil option mm -hmm. with, the, with the three positions. The single coil was very much like a jazz bass bridge pickup. And the parallel output had the classic music man sound, which is great for the... Now, I don't like that so much for... I want more of the... I don't know if you can really hear it, but it's, sure. it's thinner, a little more attack. And so the Sterling was the first bass that gave me all that. Mm -hmm. It just had great tone, but it had the variety of tones that I needed. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I, I played the Sterling for years. I mean, great bass. Right. I, I, I still use the Sterling in, on some recordings. You know, it, it's, it's been great working with them because obviously I have some Sterlings at home. I have a Stingray 5 that I play with John Petrucci for a long time. So when I record, I have the luxury of seeing which one sits best in the track. And mm -hmm. sometimes, this would be my first choice, but sometimes I'm like, eh, let's see what else we, we got, what other colors we got. Right. And, and I'll go and um, I'll do some tracks on the Sterling, 
Uh, I did one on a uh, Sterling HH, actually, on the uh, New Flying Colors record. And I still use the Stingray 5 a lot. That's a great bass. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I have them all to, to choose from. Which right, is, which is great. Really nice, right. yeah. So the one you have here today, this is the Bongo. This is a 4, right. correct? Bongo this 4? This is a Bongo 4, right. Right. So what is it about this bass? Well, I like the, uh, the, the dual humbuckers. And when, when the, we started working on this bass, I, this was the first bass that they wanted to do a multi-pickup bass on. They, they hadn't done one in a while. The, the Sabre had gone by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, uh, let's do a multi-pickup bass. And they, they started from scratch with the bongo. And I really like this because this now the bridge pickup's a little farther back. So I have even more of that kind of jazz bassy sound. Right. Um, and then plenty of tonal options with the two um, humbuckers there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's your basic bridge pickup. With a little thin for me for that. And then when I go in the middle, now that's my, that's all four coils. And then of course you have the kind of, that's, a, that's more, almost a P bass sound. Uh, which I hardly ever use, but, um, <laughs> but it's there if you need. But it's there, yeah. It's it's a nice tone. I've actually used it on a couple recordings for other people where it's like, oh, we need more of that P bass thing. Although I'm not sure it was this bass, but um, so anyway, a lot of tonal variety, great EQ, mm -hmm. and I really like. Oh, and this is the first time they they made a 24 fret neck, mm -hmm. which um, I was very happy about. You know, I love I like having that. Right. Now I've recorded. So many solos with with the high notes that, that they have to keep making it. Right. <laughs> like, You're all the I way use up. that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the songs we'll do tonight, I'm up there. Right. Right. So, yeah. So that's it. But it's basically a different sound, and I, I really like the sound of this bass. And the harmonics are very rich on this one, and that that has to do partially with the position of the pickup and mm -hmm. and the kind of pickup it is. I mean, you know, we went right. through a lot of changes. I was fortunate to be part of the kind of development team with the bongo. They brought me out several times and it, it was great because we compared pickups and preamps and where we went, we centered the EQs and I had a, a hand in all that. So it was, right. it was really, really nice. And they had a great setup. I mean, I had a Sterling there and I think we had a, a Fender of some kind, an amp. And then we had a bongo with an empty cavity where we could pop different pickups in mm. and out. And different, and so we really put it through some paces before right. we decided on all this. Right, yeah. right, right. So with all the different techniques you use, you, you play finger style and you do popping and slapping, and you're also, I was watching you do some tapping and you're doing multiple strings at the same time. Do you have to make compromises in your action or how do you set that up so that you can do all those techniques cleanly? Um, well, I don't really make compromises in my action for a certain thing. I just like my action a certain way and okay. it all responds well to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I keep it fairly low. I mean, I pl obviously you've, you've seen me play. I play a lot of technically tricky stuff. So I can't have real a uh, high, hard to play action. It's just not mm -hmm. going to suit the material that I play. Mm -hmm. So the action's pretty low and, and everything seems to, to respond well to it. I mean, I have to find that uh, point where everything's working and also where recording is not an issue where it's just buzzy and crazy. Right. You know, this right. one's actually buzzing a little bit from every time you fly. Right. It gets a little nutty, <laughs> After adjust, right. but, but it's playing great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, but, but yeah, it's just nice and low and I use pretty light strings to uh, try and execute all this stuff that these, these guys want me to play. Yeah, right, right, all those demands that they put on you. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, so congratulations on your career, all, tremendous oh, amount you. of music, great things going on. You've got the new Flying Colors record, will be coming out in about a month, I think. Is yeah, end of uh, September, and then we hit the road for a couple weeks. So, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, lots of great stuff going on. Yeah. Thanks for so much sure. for being here. We're looking forward to the workshop tonight. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, my pleasure, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. Mm -hmm.